Underground bunker. This is your proprietor on a chilly day in New York. You want news? Oh, I got news. So listen, uh, I want to thank Chris Shelton once again. After the disappointment of a hung jury and mistrial in the Danny Madison case on November 30th, rumors were running rampant about why the jury had been unable to come up with a unanimous verdict on all three counts. After the announcement of the mistrial, Judge Olmedo allowed the attorneys uh, to go into the jury room and talk to the jurors. And after that, I was, I was told that the jury had been dazzled by defense attorney Philip Cohen's suits, or that it had been, um, it had been swayed by things that were said in their presence in the hallway by family members on either side of the case. I mean, it sounded to me like rumors, and so I, I withheld judgment at that time. So then Chris came to me a few days later with the stunning news that one of his viewers was the daughter of the jury foreman and that she had persuaded her father to give Chris an interview. I was excited. Uh, Chris brought me in because he knew I was in the courtroom and I could identify the jury foreman because I'd seen him. And also because I could quickly, you know, summarize the testimony that we wanted him to talk about. And look, let me, let me point out something that may not be obvious to everyone. Uh, there were 12 jurors and three counts. Uh, in this trial. So that, that's a total of 36 votes that were cast. And 25 of them were for acquittal. 25. The jury foreman accounted for three of them. And so if you watch the interview, you'll see that I, it wasn't that I was so much asking him what he thought of the testimony and how he voted. I was asking him what the dispute was in the jury room between the 12 jurors. And I, I thought he actually did a pretty good job describing those disputes for us. Now, since then, some very good questions have been raised about the foreman's identity, his background, and his relationship with his son, who has a sex crime conviction. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was wrapped up in a lot of rumor and speculation and some really ugly allegations about his daughter. So, you know, once again, to his credit, Chris Shelton did us all a favor and reached out to the juror and the daughter and asked about these questions in a couple of phone calls. He and I talked it over and we decided we would just present the information from those phone calls to you because we thought the results of them were both pretty clear. That's where we went wrong, is that obviously people <laughs> raise a lot of rumor and speculation about what we thought had been pretty clear. So let me make it very plain. Chris Shelton and I were not endorsing the jurors' responses, and we were not taking them as satisfactory answers in the interview we published yesterday. We had gotten a, a copy of the actual jury questionnaire uh, that was used in the trial. And Chris pointed out to the juror directly that at least three of the questions should have required him to reveal that his son had a sex crime conviction, something that he obviously did not do. His excuse was that he hadn't been a part of his son's life since 1996. So he didn't think he had to reveal that information. He also let us know that he had not spoken up about the fact that he was involved in law enforcement in some way because he wasn't directly asked that question. Again, we only know these things because Chris Shelton asked him. Now, of course those are unsatisfactory answers, and this man should never have been on that jury. He should have divulged that he had a background in law enforcement, and of course he should have answered 
three separate times that he had a son with sex crime conviction. Why didn't he? I like Texas lawyers' assessment. It was cop arrogance. Let me in that room and I'll set things straight. And the people who need to ask themselves how this man managed to get through the jury selection process are the DA and Judge Omedo, who apparently needs to write a better jury questionnaire that asks about background in law enforcement, for example. <laughs> I also want to say, if this jury had convicted Danny Masterson, this juror's obfuscations would be plenty of reason for a reversal. But it didn't happen that way. It was a hung jury and a mistrial. And again, 25 of the 36 votes were for acquittal. Thanks to Chris Shelton, we have some idea what the problems were in the prosecution's case that would produce that many not guilty votes. And it provides, you know, something of a roadmap for how the DA can do a better job in the retrial. After we uh, interviewed the juror early in December, the defense asked him to sign an affidavit saying that a retrial, in his opinion, would be useless. And defense attorney Philip Cohen uh, was in court last week and he tried to argue to Judge Olmedo that this was a good reason to dismiss the charges. Uh, Deputy DA Reinhold Mueller uh, argued that his, dis his discussions with the jurors in the jury room suggested that they had just not done their job properly. They had dismissed anything to do with Scientology. They didn't consider the uh, testimony of the expert and other things. And that's why he said a retrial was warranted. But let me tell you, I was sitting right there in the courtroom. And I saw Judge Olmedo admonish both of them. She told them outright, stop telling me what the jurors in a hung jury think. It doesn't matter anymore. A mistrial has been declared. The DA's office wants a retrial. And in that situation... There's almost no way a judge uh, like old Judge Olmedo is going to dismiss charges in such a serious, violent crime. So that first jury is history. We will be starting over. And what should the DA do to make sure they get a conviction this time? Well, Chris Shelton has done them a huge service by providing some answers to that. This man, who was the foreman, should never have been on the jury, but he was. And his descriptions of what was insufficient in the DA's case, I understand. It may pain some people to hear that. But that information provides, you know, some key insights for a successful prosecution in the second round. So, look, I just want to uh, thank Nina as well, okay? The woman who was watching... Uh, Chris's videos for three years before her father managed to find himself on this jury. I thoroughly enjoyed the interview that Chris did with her. Um, she's obviously a thoughtful, curious, intelligent woman who was hoping for a conviction. Instead, she's been attacked as some kind of Scientology operative trying to undermine the case. And there's been some really ugly accusations thrown at her including sexualizing her in a really misogynistic way. It's gross. But I'm glad we have people like Chris Shelton who are dedicated to asking good questions and, and letting the answer speak for themselves. Uh, and again, I'll say we probably should have said more than we did yesterday when we provided those uh, conversations to you, made it a little more plain uh, what the point of that was. So, uh, look, I hope I've helped you understand a few things about um, this whole situation and um, uh, the interviews that were posted yesterday at TonyOrtega.substack.com. If you're just seeing this on YouTube, please go to TonyOrtega.substack.com. You can see these interviews that Chris did with the jury foreman and his daughter. Just a couple more notes. Um... Yesterday, or Sunday, we put out, uh, yeah, Sunday we put out a um, the third episode of Group Therapy, which is just for our subscribers. But this week, there was a little something in there that was news. 
So I'm going to pull out that segment and release it for everyone tomorrow. Uh, just a short segment I think you'll find really interesting. And one more thing I want to say is that I, I have a really pretty substantial piece coming out in another publication. Uh, and so this week I'm very busy with edits and, and things might be a little light in the bunker. So uh, please bear with me in the next few days. But uh, from Summer in New York. This is your proprietor signing out.